Okay, so we're going to talk about some um, interesting cases here. So we have some people uh, who are in the room with me and, and obviously some people who are online. Um, so I put here a couple of cases that I thought would be good for, you know, good fodder for discussion. So just start here. So the goal today is I hope, you know, we can review some use uh, of ultrasound for some complex clinical problems and maybe some good fodder for discussion, like I said. And look at some artifactual, non-artifactual findings and impact on different different diagnosis. So case one, this is a uh, 56-year-old uh, female, um, with history of fornia's gangrene and recent acute kidney injury. There's suspicion of uh, query AIN with antibiotics. Uh, this is female. It's actually male. Sorry, just a mistake there. It's the male who had fornia's. He comes back in post discharge. He's got uh, basically respiratory failure. And he came back in actually, uh, he was discharged with uh, some kidney failure just prior. So he comes back in now with ongoing kidney failure, hasn't changed much from when he was discharged. And also obviously some worsening severe respiratory failure, which wasn't really an issue when he was admitted for four days. Um, so comes in with this X-ray here, okay. And uh, you can see here, Crown's elevated, obviously, you resolve it at the count of 577, hemoglobin 112, and a BNP of 120. Now, when I got this phone call, it was very much like, I think this is maybe COVID versus, you know, aspiration versus hospital card pneumonia slash mucard pneumonia. He was at home for seven days, so hospital card pneumonia seems less likely. Um, and he's on 100% OptiFlow and really was not doing well, um, had an elevated respiratory rate. 28 in hypertensive. Start antibiotics. The emerge doc suggests main patient needs to be intubated urgently. We talked about this back and forth, and I felt that that given the hypertension, given the X-ray, that there was a possibility this was in fact just von overload. No, and at the time I actually didn't know they had renal failure because it just wasn't actually raised at all in the discussion for a consultation. So here's the first. You know, I went and saw the patient, obviously after, um, I suggested they initiate BiPAP, and then I went and read the patient uh, later on in the day. So here's the first set of images. This is from the uh, R1 position, okay, and that's R2 there. This position's L1. So this is very much kind of a focus on the anterior chest, oh, sorry, on the anterior chest wall. So who wants to take a crack at what they see here on these images? Yeah, so fairly, you know, I'd say fairly symmetrical in terms of beeline pattern, right? And uh, what are your what are your thoughts on the depth of the images here? Yeah, I mean. You know, when you look at the depth for lung ultrasound, you'll hear varying accounts of somewhere between eight to 10 to 15 centimeters. So some people suggest that it should be 15 centimeters. So you ensure that the, that the B lines go all the way to the far field. I think that, that, that might get a little bit um, more theoretical than practical. Um, usually when you're looking at lung ultrasound, you're trying to balance, you know, some of the subplural artifacts with even just the kind of plural focused artifacts. So, Looking at the plural line, you talked about B lines. Does the plural line look fairly normal? Slightly thick and a bit irregular. Yeah, a tiny bit irregular, right? Recognizing that this is this is a phased array probe, you know, there's often discussions about tissue harmonic imaging in lung ultrasound. So does anybody anybody know what THI refers to? So tissue harmonic imaging refers to basically the, the ultrasound probe emits a, a frequency that's called the fundamental frequency. And that fundamental frequency um, creates a lot of near field scatter, okay? It can impede your images, especially in cardiac imaging. And so usually what the probe is receiving is resonant frequencies. And so what THI, do, THI does is it blocks transmission of the fundamental frequencies. 
That way you reduce near field scatter. Okay, so technically it's artifact reduction technology and that's why it's often encouraged to turn THI off. Now, does it really impact visualization of feed lines? That's a little more challenging to truly say whether that is really that important. And I don't think it's been controlled in any way that could prove that THI necessarily reduces your feed line count. So, you know, based off your prior lung ultrasounds, what's kind of top of your differential so far for this gentleman? Palmer Dima? Okay, great. Anything else? Yeah. ARDS could be aspiration pneumonitis, for example, right? Or, you know, anything under the, the, the topic of non cardiac edema. Now, what do we see here? We have a, this, I should say, this is a right, um, I was standing patient right. So this is his right side, mid axillary line uh, with the per marker uh, pointed towards the head. For sure. Yeah. 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 Consolidation, small amount, and some and some effusion, right? Um, but yeah, I agree. This there is some, you know, you are obscuring the upper half of this image. Okay, so but certainly you can see that there's a plural effusion there. And I think again, just kind of building up our case, you know, there's some diffuse initial findings, there's some there's a plural effusion. There's a small fusion on the left side as well. So this was the first image we got actually was a peristeral image. And this, you know, how do you guys feel about kind of the orientation, depth, angle, and gain here? Pardon me? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 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 No, for sure. That's great. So really you're just focusing on an increased depth um, to make sure there's nothing else that's kind of effusive. Now focusing down, we reduce the depth here to focus on the, the actual function itself. And what image is this called? Personal long axis. Exactly. Awesome. And what are the kind of key things that we can determine from this image? I get a bit of a global assessment of LD function, determine if the LD is thickening, septum and the atmospheric wall. I get a bit of an assessment of what the qualitative function of the mitral is on. get a bit more of an assessment of the aspect valve, but we don't see this. Yeah. So, what do you think that, you know, is there any, you know, pericardial effusions here or flow effusions or any LV function in the Looks pretty unremarkable, right? Pretty normal. So, any evidence of regurgitation here? No. Yeah. So, it looks fairly normal, right? The flow pattern, there's nothing that would show uh, an acceleration of blood flow or aliasing. So, no regurgitation. I'm looking across the aortic valve, do you see anything abnormal catches our eye? No, I agree. So, really, nothing that would suggest. Let's say aortic regurgitation or even stenosis. Fairly faint personal short axis. Function normal or abnormal? Looks good. Yeah, it looks good, right? It's not the highest quality view, but you know, within the limits of this exam. Now to apical four chamber. I would say that, you know, here, how would you comment on the endocardial resolution? What do you guys think? Is it good or is it wanting? Maybe you can't quite tell the bullet if you're The outer part is fine, the middle part is not so good. Yeah. Maybe the game's a little low. Yeah. Yeah. It just, you know, this is not a high quality. I mean, I think that the actual axis of acquisition here is is nice. Like the, I don't think it's that foreshortened per se, but the endocardial resolution is for sure limiting. So it makes it more challenging to assess, to assess function. But given that we've seen that we've already seen the personal long and the personal short. I think we can more safely say that function is probably normal. And again, some color over that mitral valve. Anything abnormal? No. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's just a smidge kind of in the what's called the internal cardiac crux in here, which is kind of overlapping. But otherwise, there's really no evidence of uh, regurgitation on either left or right sides. Okay, there's a tap C just, just for the sake of being comprehensive which the trachospedanular stalk plant excursion 
you know, greater than 1.6 is normal. This is 1.9. Building into more diastology. So, you know, if, if our proposition was that this is diastolic heart failure, you might say, you know, what do the ENAs look like? This gets, a, this gets certainly a little more challenging in terms of, um, you know, analysis. This is pulse wave Doppler at the leaflet tips and diastole. And you have your E wave and you have your A wave. Your E wave is uh, passive filling, okay, from the left atrium of the LV. And your E wave is your, is your uh, active filling, atrial contraction. So looking at this, this general pattern, we just think this, is this normal appearing or is this abnormal? A hundred percent, yes. Yeah, because you know, effectively you get this when when it's lower grade diastolic dysfunction, you can have a lower E, higher A, and then you get this pseudo normalization, right? So yeah, certainly this is it's hard to interpret just an E and an A. Okay, but importantly, they are in sinus rhythm um, and they have normal systolic function. That, that's also important too. Um, so you know, usually when you start to see more advanced forms of diastolic dysfunction, you also see more advanced forms of systolic dysfunction too. Um, but here's your E to A, and so your E is greater than A. Okay, now looking at, this is our tissue diastolic imaging. Okay, this is myocardial velocities on the medial and lateral annulus. So how do you guys think about the, the general velocities here? So it's E prime, and that's A prime. So medial is 10.6, lateral is 12.7. Normal, abnormal, fairly normal, right? Yeah. How come the, and why would the lateral annulus be more than the medial annulus? And it, and it generally is, I should say, just to clarify. So just so I make sure I understand what's happening. So that's measuring the speed at which the lateral uh, hydrocarbon annulus is going away from control. Exactly. Yeah. So that this is relaxation. Yeah. So when the LV relaxes in diastole, there's no least you're getting here, but the pattern is, is fairly, um, characteristic but basically systolic function diastolic function and this is again your e prime and a prime the prime distinguishes that this is this is tissue diastolic imaging and not pulse wave doppler okay so that's your e relaxation and a relaxation a prime relaxation so usually um a normal value medial is around 10 and a normal value around laterals around 12 and that's because the the lateral annulus is not tethered as much as the medial annulus so this is fairly uh, characteristic. In fact, when it flips, okay, when the when the medial annulus moves more than the lateral annulus, what are you gonna say less? Constriction. Constri yeah, constriction, exactly. That's that's uh, annulus inversus, right? So this is this is very characteristic of just a regular uh, systolic function. So this is important in the context, you know, as a patient effusions, B lines, but diastology is actually fairly normal, you know. Um, you know, as much as there's E and there's A waves. Really, I think for anybody who's doing, who's practicing kind of more advanced critical care echo, your E and E primes together are probably the most important parts of your assessment and, and left atrial size. So this is kind of what happens. This is that we're just talking about this super normal, maybe E is a bit higher than A. And then normal E is a tiny bit higher than A. This kind of reflects how much filling is in each phase. Okay, so there's normally a bit more passive filling than there's active filling. And then, you know, this is that abnormal relaxation where your atrium is working really hard to fill that stiff ventricle, but eventually you get that pseudo normalization where you start to see a, can see a really high E and a small A, and you can see that a bad like a restriction oh, versus super normal look fairly similar. Okay, and this is where tissue diastolic imaging really helps because take a look at the E prime here versus the E prime there. So that's why you know like the the E and A just aren't enough for your assessments. It's for looking at how the, how the LV relaxes. And so interestingly, when you compare your E to E prime, okay, uh, a value less than eight, okay, would suggest that the filling pressures are not, are not evaluated, or, or sorry, are, are with normal limits. Eight to 15 is kind of no man's land, okay? But, you know, greater than 12, greater than 15, basically the, the risk of elevated atrial pressures is substantial. So very high E wave, very low E prime. So that this can even be done in atrial fibrillation when there is no A wave because you'll have a predominant, obviously, E wave and AFib. So an E over E prime greater than, you know, most resources suggest over 15 would suggest elevated atrial pressures. Do you compare it to 
for the lateral bend? Usually you'd average them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's how you kind of get over that. Um, you just average them. But obviously, you know, if you incorporate things like severe myxonic calcification, um, sewing rings around valves, like this starts to really alter how the heart moves. Um, so bundle branch blocks as well, alter movement. So there are caveats to making such measurements, um, especially when it comes to tissue diastolic imaging. Hey guys, um, I joined in a little bit late. Uh, great talk, Brian. Um, who's in the room right now? Uh, for, uh, like it's Laz, Jeff, and who else? Uh, it's Laz and Jeff who are with me. Perfect. Yeah, and then uh, online. Can yeah. you go back to that previous image just for a quick, quick second? I just want to give the guys a bit of an approach to this. Yeah. So guys, if you say, for example, you had a patient who was in your heart uh, ICU and they had, you know, B lines everywhere, x-ray kind of looking like pulmonary edema, and they had no findings and LV dysfunction at all, maybe a little bit of a thick ventricle as, as Brian has kind of shown up some images with that. And the, uh, the valves on the left side are fine. There's no AS, there's no AI, there's no MR, there's no MS. If you had to pick one of the tests that uh, Brian has already mentioned, whether it's tissue TDI or if it's mitral valve inflows, which one would you use as your screening for diastolic dysfunction? Tissue Doppler. Yeah, tissue Doppler, right? So if your lateral annulus doesn't move more than 10 centimeters and your uh, medial annulus doesn't move, uh, move more than eight, you can automatically think as Remember that whole mitral valve inflow is like uh, Brian's already mentioned on the far left side and as well as um, on the pseudo normalization, they look fairly similar. So your mitral valve inflow in and of itself doesn't tell the story, right? Yeah. Exactly. So you need your TDI first. So generally what I do when I'm in the ICU and I'm really busy and I want to know, well, I have a fairly normal heart here, but maybe the left atrium is a little bit big. Maybe I, my IVC is a bit plethoric and I'm going back to my apical four chamber view. And I'm like, for bang for my buck, what am I actually going to do to figure this out? I'll actually do the TDIs first. I'll do the lateral and the medials, right? And if those ones are less than 10 and eight respectively, then I will go on to do the mitral valve inflow, right? If I needed to save myself some time, right? And that's a classic thing that they'll ask because um, when they when you guys do write your exam eventually in January, if you guys are going to challenge that exam, that's exactly what they'll ask. They'll ask like, which is the most important thing, or what do you do first? And then you like, if you're going to do the full exam anyways, you're going to do the mitral flows anyways. But if you had to, you know, like if you had five seconds to figure this out, you would do the TDIs first, and then if they're low, then you can start doing the mitral valve inflows, and you can figure out the grading of one, two, and three, right? So normal or super normal, abnormal relaxation or impaired uh, uh, filling, basically pseudo normalization, and then restriction with the big E to A uh, difference, like obviously the E to A gets uh, bigger than one, or, or you know if it's really bad, greater than two. And then the E to E primes also tell the story as well, because the tissue TDIs tell a lot of information, right? Even abnormal relaxation, you already see that your E prime goes down in comparison to your A prime, right? Your A prime is doing a lot of the work as, as Brian had mentioned, right? So just a quick kind of like, if you had only five seconds to figure this out, do your TDIs first. And if it's abnormal in your TDIs, then you can go ahead and uh, do the mitral valve inflow. Sorry. As, uh, as I've heard, you know, uh, my, my, uh, my colleague Rob Arnfield mentioned that, you know, your left atrial size is the kind of A1C of diastolic dysfunction. So <laughs> if your atrial size is enlarged too, it also uh, kind of adds credence to diastolic dysfunction, right? So, and obviously, um, you know, once you kind of get to this phase, it's less likely that you'll be able to kind of diurese them down or change your function. But um, there is some idea that abnormal relaxation, you could potentially diurese them down to more normal diastolic filling. Okay, so uh, next we did, I just did a, a LVOT VTI, which was 19, you know, fairly good waveform here for your uh, stroke volume assessment. And honestly, I, I kept this quick because um, I just want to make sure I got a decent assessment there. And there is, there is some phasicity with respiration, um, albeit fairly minimal. Now, so the LV function is normal, okay? And really no evidence of elevated filling pressures. Now on to the vena cava. This is oftentimes the, the kind of cited as one of the least reliable structures uh, in the body for a number of reasons. Granted, this patient's not ventilated, so it does remove some of that uh, confounders, right? Um, we measured this IVC, 2.5 centimeters. Okay, I, it, I didn't show the numbers here for uh, variability, but uh, it was like less than 10%. And again, they're not ventilated. So um, effectively, you know, what would this suggest, if anything? Unlikely to be volume responsive if they were probably 
Yeah. So, you know, probably an elevator HL pressure. And that, that's always that's always very challenging to to use the IVC amp for a number of reasons because it's it's hard to know um, the, the, the significance of that, right? It's more or less like finding an elevated seat central venous pressure. Um, it, it's actually less reliable, like as an absolute value, um, the, it's less reliable as a predictor, um, just like CVP. Now, there's some arguments that dynamic changes are probably more predictable, um, but it's still hard to know that. So now looking at the paddock vein, okay, he's looking at the color first off. How does the color look to, to everybody? Does that look, so it's mostly blue, right? Unidirectional, Unidirectional flow. flow. Looks fairly normal, right? Not, but there's no, there's no red showing up, okay, in that, uh, in this cross section here. Okay, now here's the, the actual uh, pulse wave Doppler. Okay, there's obviously no ECG gating here. Now I can tell you, I think what's happening here is there's some hepatic vein um, waveforms that are actually interrupting this. So you have to omit these. This is the challenge I often find with doing hepatic vein in this um, axis is the waveforms I find fundamentally less reliable, okay? But this is the S wave and that's the D wave. S wave, D wave. So the, during systole, there's, there's uh, systolic filling, D wave, okay? So what you notice, this looks like a prominent, like this you would see as red, right? So for some reason, spectral is picking up a flow pattern that's not there. So I moved uh, from the, to the flank, okay? Because the flank I find offers more reliable flows. Allows you, you were just saying the same thing, hey? Yeah, it's so much better to get the paddock vein close in the flank. There's, I think there's just less, uh, less noise. Okay, so, and this is obviously much clearer, right? Do you guys know what this wave would be? A wave. Yeah, it just the, the atrial inflection just as the, uh, as the annulus goes up during relaxation. Okay, then there's your, then, then, and then there's your systolic filling, your S wave, and your D wave. Your S wave is normally a bit larger than your D wave. So this is a very normal pattern. It's mostly anti-grade. Um, so yeah, there is, there is elevated retro pressure, but blood is still flowing in the right direction, seemingly. Okay, so again, this is just acquired from the flank. Uh, I prefer this view far, far better um, for getting your uh, spectral dopplers. Now, um, there is this idea that perhaps um, this S wave will shrink over time. Okay, as you see increasing retial pressures, the S wave shrinks, okay, and then eventually can reverse. Now, trigesmic regurgitation will just cause a de facto S wave reversal because, of course, that blood just leaks through in, in systole and, and makes the effectively just causes that big uh, bump of pressure during systole to go up. Okay, but you know, certainly this can happen even in the absence of severe trigesmic regurgitation. So, this can happen when you have uh, elevated radial pressures that S wave will shrink and can reverse. And again, there's some speculation that, you know, with things like diuresis, uh, with lowering venous pressures that you can actually kind of normalize this S wave down, uh, down below the baseline. Okay. So, but certainly as you go up here, there's more of this reversal and more of this organ congestion. Okay. Which is, you know, we're kind of getting into this whole idea of this, uh, basically a venous assessment organ congestion or vexus, which is very hot and poorly understood. So, What's the overall impression of this patient? Back to this patient's case, you know, renal failure, recently admitted for Fourniers, comes in short of breath, has an extra multiple consolidation, has some diffused B lines, effusions. Pre ultrasound, our uh, working diagnosis was maybe we were here a little bit more towards volume of fluid pulmonary edema. Post ultrasound, I think it's less likely cardiogenic with normal systolic diastolic physiology. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, I certainly um, uh, would think that too, that this seems less likely. Now, um, interestingly, I'll kind of get to uh, how this case kind of wraps up, but basically the, the issue with using uh, the heart as a barometer is if the heart is normal, it's actually less reliable as a barometer of volume. And, you know, the, the other thing is that you look at organ perfusion and traditionally you've always thought that cardiac output is the dominator for things like renal perfusion. Um, but the, tr the trouble is that our systolic pressure and mean arterial pressure are much less reflective of the, uh, first of all, the arterial capillary pressure and much less reflective of the, basically the starling forces in the, in the peripheral tissue. 
So if you have a, a very high venous pressure, but a low arterial pressure, you actually have a much lower, um, basically, uh, trans, like much lower gradient than you think. Um, so your post arterial venous pressure can affect this gradient and encapsulated organs, um, development of interstitial edema can result in elevation of interstitial pressure. And this can decrease organ blood flow. So when they've actually looked more closely between kidney function, and cardiac output, there's actually much less of a clear relationship. Um, so everybody, you know, for example, historically people talk about the cardiorenal uh, syndrome, which is, uh, you know, uh, Adams in the line. It's an extremely poorly understood, poorly described uh, syndrome, which uh, oftentimes we're left kind of scratching our heads with, you know, uh, what can we possibly do um, for these patients? Now, um, when you look at the data, actually CVP corresponds better to, to renal failure than does cardiac output. Okay, and so here's just a, a couple of graphs. So on the uh, y-axis, where's the renal function? Okay, so there's four different situations here. They're comparing central venous pressure, elevation, versus cardiac index, systolic pressure, versus wedge pressure, okay, pulmonary wedge pressure. And you can see in CVP, as CVP becomes more elevated from less than eight, okay, to greater than 24, there's a fairly direct indication between worsening renal function and worsening function is, de is, is, is defined in this study by, uh, by an actual change in creatinine that's measurable upon their hospital admission. Okay, so it's not, it's not talking about chronic kidney disease, but basically uh, as CVP increases, there is decline in renal function. But then when you look at um, cardiac index, so certainly there is some relationship, you know, albeit it's perhaps less as strong when you look at lower, uh, when you look at um, lower measures of cardiac index versus, versus absolute higher measures. And then systolic pressure, as I mentioned to you, this is not really the effective uh, arterial pressure. It's definitely not as reliable um, from predicting kidney failure. And then wedge pressure, again, is a little more tenuous in its relationship between wedge pressure and renal failure. I'm surprised the higher cardiac index was worse. Yes. Yeah, it, it is unusual, right? Um, it, so when you compare them, uh, you know, absolutely, it, it is certainly kind of an unusual relationship. This, this was in a study around, of 56 patients. Okay, where they measured this. Um, so certainly I would not say that it's, it's, a, it's a very large sample, um, but you know, certainly 55 uh, with these kind of metrics is not unreasonable. So uh, portal venous Doppler has emerged as an alternative technique to measure uh, extracardiac uh, venous congestion. The portal venous Doppler, um, essentially, usually your portal venous flow is around 20 centimeters. It's a paddle pedal. Um, and the flow is generally uh, towards the probe, okay? So the probe being up here. It's actually quite easy to find after a couple of tutorials. If you go from the right flank, the IVC uh, is along here. Okay, the pad vein would be here and look at a little more caudal, you come across your portal vein. So uh, there you go, portal vein right there. Oh. Okay, now you can place pulse wave across this portal vein. Okay, wow. and so yeah. So the way that this looks here, I expect this patient probably has TR, okay? Um, because this is such severe, uh, basically, physicity, like pulsatility and, and regular, that uh, that's probably the most likely thing, okay? These two are not the same because see how this red flow is kind of constant and steady? That's the normal portal venous flow. It's kind of undulating, but the pulsatility fraction is, is like less than 50%, it's just like 20, 30%, like minimal flow, okay? So this is dramatic from peaks to troughs, it's, it's quite large, right? So this is very pulsatile flow. This would be a normal, oh, sorry, this is actually abnormal by criteria. So you're actually 50% flow, okay, from peak to trough. So this is, and this is actually the patient's um, portal vein, okay? So you have 50% pulsatility in that patient's portal vein. There's the reference standard. Okay, so you can see here that, you know, it, it's not necessarily, when you're looking at low velocities, uh, it can be challenging. So you should use an actual, uh, an actual marker for velocities. So typically it's monophasic, it's above the baseline, it's towards the probe and it's undulating. Okay, that's a very normal looking uh, portal vein. This has been studied for like 30 years, okay? The issue with the portal vein is that you can see portal vein uh, pulsatility in healthy young patients, okay? And that's one of the, I think that's probably a big limitation to this technology, looking at this particular structure.
Um, so it all has to be interpreted obviously within context. And I think that's why using uh, several markers of venous congestion is more compelling than one. Because I, I think this could have problems. Further, if you have cirrhosis and other measures of elevated hepatic resistance, and this also starts to change. Okay, you can see biphasic flow. You can see the reversal of flow or what's called the hepatofugal flow where it goes below the baseline. So obviously liver disease can alter how this, uh, how these flow patterns look. And that needs to be, I think, kept in uh, consideration. Now looking at the, this is looking at flow within the kidney itself. Okay. Intrarenal. Um, yeah. on this patient. Yes. And this is, so this is interlobular flow or sorry, interlobar. Okay. So the pulse wave, uh, what you get here is this is the baseline above the baseline is arterial below the baseline is venous. Okay. So in this patient, they have what's called biphasic flow. Okay. So there's, there's roughly, uh, two, I think there's some artifacts here that's uh, mirroring, but there's roughly two, uh, per arterial flow. Okay. So that's, this is what a, a normal, um, interlobar venous flow looks like it's continuous. Okay. So it's not discontinuous. Okay. Cause discontinuous infers that there is enough venous pressure. Okay. That it's periodically coming to a, coming to a halt. Okay. So this, um, these interestingly have been studied more so in heart failure and in the heart failure literature, things like, uh, changing from, from this continuous flow to periodic flow corresponds to more advanced levels of heart failure. So it goes from being biphasic, roughly two waveforms per systolic flow, this is venous, to even monophasic, where it's just one little bump uh, per arterial flow. Okay, again, but this is artery above baseline, vein below, because you can't separate this out because they're small, they're small vessels. So this is, you know, as you, there is kind of this scale then, okay, this is from JAF 2016. Okay, so you look at normal right atrial pressure to escalating right atrial pressure. It goes from continuous to pulsatile to biphasic to monophasic. Okay, we're going to skip the renal artery. It gets a little more complicated there. And then to hepatic vein. Okay, so hepatic vein we talked about. The S wave shrinks, D wave goes up, and then eventually F S wave reverses as your right atrial pressure escalates. Portal vein goes from continuous to discontinuous. And even to and fro. Your IVC obviously becomes less compliant because this reflects that your venous capacitance is really at its at its peak. And then you correspond your your indices of um, right sided diastology actually, which is kind of unusual. But this is you know we talked about left um, sided flows. But this is actually right sided flows. Um, so a similar phenomenon happens where you see a drop in your E prime towards more advanced um, phases of of uh, right side diastolic failure. And this is a, a recent um, posting by um, by a nephrologist who's very much kind of in the ultrasound world, talking about how the score gets put together. So if diameter is greater than two, uh, you're going to equal to two. You look at the hepatic vein. Our hepatic vein was normal. Okay, our portal vein Doppler was abnormal. We had a pulse tilt index greater than fifty percent, um, and we also had a mildly abnormal renal vein Doppler. And so on the scoring system, that's, this corresponds to kind of a grade two moderate congestion. Okay. This is another patient um, actually with a similar story. Okay. You can see the renal vein Doppler is much clearer here. Okay. Being uh, biphasic. This is by far the most challenging aspect of this examination. And honestly, I would say, in half the patients, renal, renal vein flows are extremely poor in terms of signal acquisition. Okay, this patient had diffuse B-lines, dilated IVC, pulsatile portal vein, and biphasic flows. So this guy um, was much better in BiPAP. He was diuresed and left or non-invasive. Okay, and honestly, he did wonderfully with some diuresis. Um, so this is the interesting idea that I kind of wanted to get across here. This guy does not have heart failure, okay? He does not. He's got a compliant left atrium. He can handle the volume. There's no diastolic issues, at least that we can ascertain by pulsative Doppler. But this guy was clearly overloaded, okay? On BiPAP, on diuresis, the next day he was great, okay? When, when you examine it, did he examine his heart? He, he examined his overload, yeah. 
So he had like, he, this guy had like orthopnea and he had peripheral edema too. Um, so, you know, it's, it's very um, interesting to have this kind of paradigm where I, I think the reason about this case up is because so often we misunderstand volume assessment. Like we think that the heart is kind of the key to unlocking, you know, whether or not they're overloaded. But I, I don't think that's true for some patients, right? And, and that's where um, certainly I struggle with understanding uh, volume assessment. Now, clinically, this guy responded textbook for overload. Okay. And his overload, but his overload was, was not from cardiac origin. His overload was, was renal in origin. Like he had a drop in GFR. He, his volume assessment got, volume assessment got worse okay, as an outpatient and came back in overloaded. Was his uh, sonograph assessment on non-basic or MC? He... Uh, he was on a non-basic guy. Okay. Yep. Have had some improvement, I guess. It's possible, but the next day he had a comprehensive echo um, off. Uh, it was fine. Yeah, yeah. He had no intact LV, normal diastolic function. Everything was normal. And perhaps you could argue that. Oh, so go ahead. I was just going to say, Brian. I think that's a really in, like sorry, very key assessment. We always think that volume overload always has to do with the heart, but we already know like kidneys can cause volume overload, uh, you know, nephrotic syndrome, all those kind of things, liver failure. If you have low oncotic pressure from low albumin can cause volume oh. overload. So yeah, it just kind of goes back to the idea of first principles guys. Like, yeah, the echo is normal, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not still going to respond to diuresis because diuresis can still affect the kidneys, affect the liver, uh, pathologies and things like that. So I think it's really important that, yeah, like we don't just hold, hone in on the heart. There's still like medicine that we have to provide to patients. Right. So, yeah. And, and I think you could argue too, that perhaps it's our technology, like maybe it's possible that echo cannot pick up diastolic function or diastolic dysfunction, even mild. Um, Cause our, our paradigms for uh, diastology are imperfect. Right. And they're revised frequently because it's just a hard concept. Um, so that being said, I think because of his, because of normal function, he was able to actually tolerate overload and, and not have that dysfunction. Okay. But uh, anyways, I talked about this case with Adam, I don't know if Adam's in the line, because it's just, you know, one of those interesting overload cases that, you know, you would expect, like I certainly expected that he'd have some cardiac dysfunction. At least B lines on ultrasound though, Brian? He did. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he so that you have other markers, viral. even if the echo is normal, you have other markers, right? So, yeah. But I think that's that the problem with, with like, streams of information right is, yeah. is you, you have to understand what's the what's the relevant stream of information and i do think actually ultrasound was probably disservice in this case okay um but brian we spoke yeah. right so vince so he had yeah. he had you know evidence of pulmonary edema but pulmonary this is what brian are talking about. pulmonary edema is not heart failure right no pulmonary it's not edema. exactly it increased hydrostatic pressure that yeah. basically forced fluid into the interstitium and, and airspace right so mm -hmm. I think that's where, you know, to Laz's point is that you have to understand that pulmonary edema can be, you know, hydrostatic or non-hydrostatic, and it could be from heart failure, or it could just be due from volume overload due to an inability to excrete your, you know, the fluid that you have. So, 100%. Anyway. Yeah. So I think Brian, like, as Adam has said, like, yeah, it's not always just the heart. It could be oncotic pressure, hydrostatic pressure, as mentioned before, from other organs failing, especially with, you know, organs that we know that can cause edema in other vascular beds and so on and so forth. The one thing I'll say to the learners guys is that like, this is something that even I, during my fellowship didn't learn like in great detail. I've learned it actually over time, right? Like, and Brian's obviously been a champion of this Katie Whisker over in, uh, in UBC has been very interested in this as well. And obviously William, who's a lot of the papers that uh, Brian yeah. has, quoted, has actually been, uh, you know, a nephrologist and, uh, and, and, uh, you know, like someone who's interested in ultrasound has kind of championed this kind of things. I think what I would say, at least from my standpoint, is that I agree with Adam. Sometimes you can clinically see that their volume overload, they have peripheral edema. There's other things, but I think that the thing that I take away from Vexus is the skill set. So the skill set of being able to pulse the, you know, the, uh, the hepatic vein, the, um, you know, the portal vein, as well as the intralobar, although it's difficult, even for, even for me, Ryan, I would say it's a skill, oh, skill set It's hard to do. 100%. But what I would say is that especially because we work in the general systems ICU at the university, whereby we have liver transplants and we have renal transplants, I think having those skills to be able to figure out a resistive indice uh, for a, a renal artery or, you know, a portal vein and stuff like that. I think that's really important because yeah, maybe it might not necessarily be, be always like, you know, vexus, you know, related, but you have the skill set to be able to investigate other pathologies, like in a new liver transplant or a new kidney transplant. I think those are going to be really interesting because 
I mean, if we could train up, let's say, for example, Victor Dong and Dean to be able to do this and be for them to be able to do uh, a portal vein assessment in the middle of the night on a patient who has a failing liver or a new re renal transplant or new kidney, um, you know, if we can train up people to know how to figure out the resistive indices of that, that way we don't let the kidney die or the liver die overnight and the surgeons go do something, you know, like, I think that's where the point of care will be. And I mean, the vexus for sure as well, but most of the time, especially if the vexus is two out of the three are suggestive, you're just diuresing anyways, or you're taking- I mean, Yeah, no, I mean, I, energy, right? so, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to embellish the value of vexus. I yeah, me I, too. I, 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 don't, I, yeah. been, I think it's the skill set. I've been over embellished, I think. Yeah. But yeah. At the same time, I, the one yeah. thing that I thought was interesting about this case, why I brought it up was because this does reflect this, this whole idea of venous capacitance. Like this patient clearly had a drop of venous capacitance, and that way their, their actual um, venous system felt all the inflections of pressure. And I, and I think that just, I just wanted to kind of maybe talk about that whole issue of, of why um, the, the venous side is, is kind of so interesting, but also so it can be so deceiving because of the mass amount of capacitance. Um, so you can have patients who have, are in, I've seen patients in frank heart failure with their entire, you know, vax assessment being, being normal. And I think that's, that is my issue with this protocol um, that, you know, well, in this case, I think it's interesting. In other cases, it is entirely seemingly useless. Um, and I've seen it before. So I, I, anyways, I'll move on here sake of time. So case two, this is a lady with polymicrobial commutacard pneumonia, spontaneous BPF and ongoing unimmigrated shock. Okay, 0.2 norepi, vasal 0.04. Had extremely poor parasternal images. And sorry, very good subcostals. I'm sorry for this is the image you guys saw at first. Um, so this is the this is actually her image. Okay, just the the images got out of uh, order. So we talked about this earlier on already. So I'm not going to belabor the point. The LV is is thick here. Okay, the RV may be over embellished because of the view. Um, now pulling up some color here. Anything abnormal there? Yeah. You know, I would wonder if they're, yeah, capturing a flash there, posterior directed MR. It's very, very fast though. Okay, and it's, it's, but it's a little bit suspicious there. Okay, but it is severely eccentric. So it makes it difficult to pick up when it's, when it's this eccentric. Okay, so nothing really, some minimal TR on the right, as you can see there, a tiny little jet on the right. Okay, now I thought, you know, there's no way they had good apicals, but surely enough, actually they had excellent apicals. Okay, and who wants to go through this apical four chamber? Sure. Good. Yeah. The atrial sized, at least on the right, looks normal. The left is maybe a little bit of a generous left atrial size. Yeah. The RV function growth looks normal. The annular uh, excursion of the trichectic valve looks like it's quite satisfactory. Yeah. Okay. There's no pericardial fusion. Okay. Anything else to add? So broadly, you know, what we've heard so far is maybe the LA is a little bit large. LA function looks grossly normal, maybe some, maybe hyperkinetic base compared to the apex. Um, RV looks grossly normal and RA size is normal. So anything else? Seven, yeah, seven looks a little generous, right? Okay, I'm gonna keep moving on here again. Another, this is kind of an in and out apical five chamber. Okay, kind of imperfect goes from a four to a five. Okay, so flow acceleration plus or minus, maybe some stoic anterior motion. Yeah. Okay, so the uh, I don't think I have that image there, but the, the actual um, left atrium, interestingly, same thing there. You can see there's flow acceleration. You know, I did capture the left atrium, but interestingly, extremely difficult to get that what I thought was the eccentric jet. It's a little bit there though, right? Yeah. I know. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. 
So it's just another fork chamber. I don't think I have two chamber actually. Anyways, so what I did, okay, was I took the pulse wave. Okay, and the pulse wave is what you use. This localizes velocity in, in a regional area, okay? And, you know, pulse wave Doppler has a max velocity somewhere between 160 and 200 times per second. And when blood speeds up, it typically goes faster than that. Like if it's clinically significant, like you guys have heard of air, in aortic stenosis, your blood velocity can be greater than four meters per second. This is, this is like 1.2 meters per second. So what we're seeing here is we can see the velocity here a little over 1.2, 1.3, and it looks normal, right? So, you know, when you're looking for a full acceleration, you kind of want to figure out where the obstruction is, okay? But the obstruction, this would correspond to what's called a mid-cavitary gradient. So certainly if you're hyperdynamic, low volume, you could have a, a gradient in the cavity. This would su suggest that there is no gradient there. There's acceleration, but there's no gradient. So walking the pulse wave down from the apex to the LVOT, oh, there's a... Walking, the, walking it down, okay, you can see here, velocity is the same, a little closer to the, to the um, kind of ent entrance to the LVOT, there's now aliasing, okay? So now you're seeing that you cannot capture the velocity, okay, and basically just maximize the velocity and it's still, still aliasing. Okay, shift to the baseline, it's still aliasing at 200, so now you're saying this is for sure, like you know, using pulse wave as an alias detector. So once you alias, you know that you, you can no longer capture the peak velocity at that area. Okay, and that area is right between the septum and where the mitral valve hits. So you put CW across. CW again is non-localizing. Okay, it's range ambiguous. But what you see here is this. Anyone want to talk about what they see here? Yeah. Yeah. Why is it dagger shaped? <laughs> Laz, any ideas? It's in the name. Dynamic. So, so, so the initial was getting through. That's right. It gets smaller, right? Like the cavity yeah. shrinks. And that's why you're you're seeing a different rise, okay, versus a fixed obstruction, which obstruction is the same throughout. But dynamics are the obstruction actually changes. Like it gets smaller, it gets more obstructed as you as the cavity shrinks. That's why it looks dagger shaped. Okay. That's it's you know. Let's see here. Dagger, there you go. Yeah, Tom got it. Dagger shape. Thanks, last point out. So then, looking at the IVC, okay, obviously it's it's fairly flat and collapsible. Yeah, one point oh seven. Looking back at this, I think I have a better. Here we go. Okay, so this is your reference standard. Okay, and it's really important to have this kind of blazed into your mind. When the mitral valve closes, okay, during systole, it remains it remains, it remains medial. Okay, in this case, however, look at that anterior, look at that leaflet. It's shifting, so it's closing and then being shifted. Close the shifts. Okay, so that's the that's kind of the textbook systolic anterior motion. Okay, and there actually is some LVH here. Okay, so SAM plus LVH is the problem, okay? Now, when we look at um, how to measure this gradient, okay, there's two ways you can measure it, mean and peak. Okay, a mean is basically a, a VTI of the curve that we just saw. I'll go back actually. So there's your peak gradient mean, 25. But actually, in uh, in dynamic elevation obstruction, you want your your max gradient, okay? Because of course, this curve is dynamic, 
Therefore, you want the smallest point, okay, which obstructs. And that corresponds best to your gradient at that peak. Okay, so any questions there? So features, positive directed MR jet, that, that was probably, I think it's there. It's just extremely subtle, okay? And was only caught subcostal. So like anterior motion we saw, you can't see mid stall closure of cusps, okay? Because that gradient gets so small, it can no longer sustain the transdial of the gradient. It is mid uh, essentially with dagger-shaped Doppler signal, and this can be provoked or altered by loading conditions. Um, it's frequently under-recognized. This is the most, the most cognitively available. People think of hokum, for example, um, or asymmetric hypertrophy. Um, but this can occur with a sigmoid septum. This can occur in a variety of reasons, but generally it requires substrate load and a change in loading conditions. Uh, severe hypovolemia or hyperkinesia, okay? So these are the kind of four factors that can really escalate your risk of uh, dynamic obstruction. So reduced preload, okay? So, for, you know, in the medicine exam, they talk a lot about the kind of squat to stand, okay, maneuver for worsening obstruction. That's why, you know, that's why that the, it's still preload dependent. So reduced afterload obviously again shrinks the cavity, increases the risk of dynamic obstruction, vasoplegia. Tachycardia just reduces chamber volumes. So oftentimes your focus is to lower the heart rate. And LV hyperkinesia, secondary to anotropic or Dobbin fusion. But, okay, that uh, hyperkinesia can happen for different reasons. For example, at a QMI, if it's mostly apical center, then you can get basal compensatory hyperkinesis, and that can cause SAM in, a, in an MI. Okay, same thing with Takatsubos, sigmoid septum, steep aortic root angle with a big, a big septal knuckle. I'm um, not as much about apparatus, like redundant cords, for example, and a whole other variety of reasons for why. Hokum, of course, is, is the primary cause that everyone thinks of, but you can see there's a number of reasons why people can develop SAM, or I should say dynamic obstruction, because SAM isn't always a part of dynamic obstruction. Here's on transesophageal echo. Okay, the same principle, mesophageal long axis. You can see that that leaflet's being pulled into the LVOT, and this is just from a uh, from a zero degree view. So aortic valve, mitral valves, he's being pulled in there. Uh, so I hope that kind of illustrates the, the kind of um, what's happening to the mitral valve itself. Well, it's being pulled into the elbow tract often by venturi forces. Okay, because the blood speeds up so fast that effectively just drags it in. Okay, and worsens the obstruction. So in the case of underpredicted shock with salmon LVH, so we gave this lady more fluids, loaded her up, we took her off norepi, put her on phenylephrine, and focused on heart rate to bring it down. So that's it for today. Hope that you guys found that uh, good discussion and um, some good fodder. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And yeah, that's it. <laughs>